Um, okay, so the first question in the list is actually one that I put there because somebody asked this question and I thought, hmm, this is a good one and maybe we should all think about this. Um, but if you do a task repetitively or maybe once a quarter um, and then you, when you go to do it the next time you don't remember how you got there, um, the great thing about Arctos is you could bookmark the location of the task. So for this one, um, they were trying to find the last catalog number, which you can do um, by looking at your catalog number gaps, and that's reports and services, labels and reports, and catalog number gaps. So if you bookmark this URL at the top, and save the bookmark with something that's meaningful to you, um, instead of going through all those menu options, you can just come straight to this screen. So um, I just wanted to pass that one along to everybody, um, that little tip, and that then this is, again, where you could find your last catalog number. So um, I'll just pick one from the top, show me the gaps. And so this shows you where you're missing cataloged items, maybe purposefully, maybe not. Um, if you scroll to the bottom, it tells you what your last catalog number used was. So that's the answer to that question. And then next up, I think we have Angie. So I'm going to stop sharing and let Angie take over. Okay, thank you for that. And I just made a note on, um, I didn't realize that we had that capability <laughs> on um, the uh, uh, catalog number gaps, but I'll just a note there that um, the, uh, that, that tip only works if you're using sequential numbering systems. Um, cultural collections, we use a little different numbering uh, system that's the trinomial numbering system, which is a year sequential accession number, and then a catalog number, so it's this tripartite numbering system. Um, and that did not result in any, <laughs> any gaps for mine, so um, I will just um, put that out there. So the question that has been tossed over to me is, that, is it possible to see our most recent loan at the top of the list and have the previous loans sequentially follow? Um, hey, so Angie. Again, yeah. Would you like can, are you able to make your screen a little bit bigger, either by, um, yeah, yeah, maximizing yeah. it? That works. Yeah, and then, it, um, and then maybe increase the resolution. So if you do Control Plus a couple times, because your oh, fields are, yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Thanks so okay. much. You bet. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so we had a t little talk about this yesterday, and. Um, this really is contingent on the numbering system that you use for your loan numbers. So as we all know, to find your loan, um, you know, you go into your um, uh, transactions and find loan, which gets you to this screen. And then um, the way we do num uh, loan numbers is, is a pretty straightforward um, system where we assign a year and then a transaction number, essentially, which is sequential. And so um, what the way that ours show up, you can see we've got this the year of the loan and then the dash 01.eh to uh, show that that's for ethnographic um, item. And, um, and so our the way that, since I'm only, I'm just using one collection, and if you manage multiple collections and you have different collection codes or endings to your number system, um, how they're going to show up, uh, we, we think it, it dumps it out in uh, probably uh, some sort of alphanumeric order, but this is something that we thought we needed to talk to Dusty a little bit about is what the um, actual coding uh, process is for how this shows. Um, but so it will, for my system, it absolutely displays it sequentially. So what I do when I have a new loan is I just have to scroll all the way to the bottom. <laughs> um, and 
uh, I find my most recently used number, and then I just use the next number. So my next loan would have been 2019-56.eh, and I would go up and create um, a new loan um, for this. So one of the things we talked about potentially doing is a, um, an issue, it looks like, um, Maybe Teresa created a, a GitHub. No, Emily created a GitHub um, issue yesterday, number 2445, um, that uh, gives us a potential option to um, do a, uh, another, uh, get us uh, a different ordering system that would put the most recently used loan number up at the top and do sort of a reverse order. Um, or having it, let's see, what is, what do you say, uh, the last number used, um, and, uh, and then hopefully Oracle would sort them properly. So this is just a very straightforward um, way of doing it, but I guess, you know, part of it depends on, again, how people are naming their loans um, and ordering them in order to have them show up properly. Yeah, and if you, Angie, if you go to the Create Loan screen, so um, right now Angie's on Find Loan. Um, if you go to Transactions, Create Loan. Um, oh, yeah. So for Angie, using like a pretty intuitive system, um, Arctos Oracle is smart enough to kind of, um, you know, have these next available loan number sidebar where she can just basically click on um, the hypertext and it'll populate automatically um, into her loan number and she can like, you know, she still might have to look up what her last um, used loan number is, but it kind of gives her a, a format. Um, whereas some of us were talking about how like we have these legacy loan number systems and it's just kind of funky and there's no way Oracle can like auto increment um, or kind of figure out how to parse those. And um, so the request I put in was actually to make um, a, either replace this or just make a new, another sidebar that's last used number um, so that you don't have to go to, you know, find loan or your own digital files stored on your computer to figure out, like, what's the next number I should use. And um, we don't rely on Arctos to try to figure that out either. And the other so, Angie, is, this is Marielle. I just wanted to address Mary Beth's comment. Um, the funkiness with the next available num loan number in the current arrangement is that it's 2020, and I think most of us haven't issued any loans yet for 2020, so the next number isn't populated. Mary Beth asked, uh, she thought that Arctos would add, like, the next number, and I think that's true. Once we have, like, 2020.001, then it will suggest that the next available one is two. Um, but we don't have any loans yet for this year, so that's why it's not putting that in there. Yeah, and I think I did just create one the other day. Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> I'm about to, though. It's on my to-do list. So, um, yeah, and our, our system doesn't, uh, our numbering system, it doesn't actually give us any numbers over here, even though we do have an intuitive system. Um, because we don't use the, the periods in it. We actually use dashes and then the period at the end. So that might screw up this pre-programmed uh, system that, that Dusty's created over here. Oh, yeah. that's good to and know. I, we should add that to the documentation for our, our um, accessions, that if you want it to, to auto-display, you need to use this particular format. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think if we do um, add, if it's easy enough to add um, what you've used last that could be easily incorporated also like in accessions, like what was your last accession number or even catalog numbers. So if you do have sort of a non-straightforward incrementing system, um, you can at least easily figure out what's your next available number without having to kind of search around too much. Speaking of that, I'm going to hand yeah. back over. Um, maybe we can, let's see, do I go on to here? Stop sharing. Um, maybe somebody can show us how that system works on the, because we, again, when we have a totally different numbering system for, um, for our catalog numbers and our accession numbers, and so maybe somebody can show how that works with the next available, because like I said, the gap didn't work for our numbering system. Um, 
So I just shared my screen. And I, I could can't. I could share mine. I can't okay, make the little box go away, so I don't know what's going on there. Um, let me try that. Okay. So I have a bunch of collections, and some people have done loans. So um, let me scroll down. So here's one right here, MSB Bird. See how they're on dot two? Mm -hmm. So they've already issued one loan in 2020. So that's good. So that's showing how it works. And I want to say, too, market. that you need to decide. And one other thing to think about is that it's it's the the loan in MSB Bird was probably 2020.01 or even 001 the previous one, um, but this format is getting rid of those zeros. You may choose to use leading zeros in front of your um, numbering system because at least in Oracle, the way that things are numbered is that um, point one and uh, it would act like a 0.10, it would actually be, so so it wouldn't order, it would put all your ones together, all your twos together, what, instead of going sequentially 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So I usually add one or two leading zeros to my accession numbers for that reason, in order to be able to look at the list of accessions in sequence. Can, can somebody show us how that works on accessions? Because I've never seen that before. Um, yeah. I'd be happy to do that if somebody wants to, if I can share the screen. Or, Teresa, you could go to accessions, can't you? Yeah, I can. For MSB? Yeah. Let's, uh, go to, go to like, mammals or something. You want to find some first? Just put 2019, and then you'll, you'll see some weirdness. Um, which is good to show everybody. Oh, right here, just 2019. Yeah. Sorry. And so you notice at the very beginning, there are some accessions from, uh, actually, that's a, a legacy. Yeah. Okay. So if you have accessions that have a 2019 in it that are in a different format, it'll still the search will still pull those up. Mm -hmm. But so see how we have the leading zeros, uh, 2019-01, 02, 03. That's in the optimistic, and actually we've almost hit 100 accessions. <laughs> Optimistically hoping that we would might might hit 100 in a year. But if uh, and you see they're sorted correctly. But if someone else then came in and put 2019. Five, it would actually, Arctos would think that was a 50 and not an 005, unless you add the leading zeros in, in terms of how it sorted it. Yeah, because it will sort, you know, when you do, so a, you specimen, might wanna... when you do a specimen search, you get um, all, everything that starts with a 1 first, whether, it, whether it's 1, 10, 100, 1,000, but the 1s come first, so this does the same thing. And at least this is how Oracle um, deals with numbers. And I'm not sure when we move to Postgres if we'll have the same issue. But um, that's the reason for the use of leading zeros is to convince it to um, force it to consider one as uh, different from 100. So my question was more about less than, because this is the same way we do our accessions, but with a UA and, and dashes rather than periods. Um, but there, so I think I thought somebody mentioned that you could find the next available also um, when you're creating a new accession, like with the with the loans, find the next loan. Is that true? Because I, if so, I didn't know that. So see here, it'll show you. It gives you suggestions. So it may not be perfect, but it's kind of telling you. Um, maybe this is this is the last number you used. Maybe you want to use the next one. Ah, I guess I never noticed that. I just ignored it. <laughs> I had a blind spot. Okay, thank you. So that makes sense then. That makes sense as to why we would want to have this consistent with loans because loan is the last number used, whereas here it's the last 
Well, actually, no. It's the, the, the loans is suggesting the next number, whereas here it's the last used. So they should be consistent with just the last used. Yeah, because mine, I my last created was a 1967-33 because yeah. I was going back and filling in <laughs> old accession information. So. Yeah, exactly. So that still may not give you an appropriate number, um, but you just have to be aware of that. Maybe we could have the option of setting it as last created or um, next in sequence. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, or just being able to see both that toggle. toggle switch would be great, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can add that to the GitHub request. That's a good idea. Awesome. Okay, are we ready to move on? Yeah, let's move on. Um, so I think we've kind of gone over this when trying to find the next loan number, no number comes up. Um, does everybody agree that we've kind of covered that with what we just talked about? Yep. Okay. Um, Mary Beth, we can't um, we can't hear you again. So can you type it in the chat box? Great, thank you. So unfortunately, yeah, so, oh, we still get. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Tree. Is that Teresa trying to speak? No, I think it's Mary. That's Beth. Mary Beth. Her microphone oh, okay. is not working. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mary Beth, we're having the weird chipmunk sounds we had earlier at the working group. So I think um, you're probably safest to use the chat because it's just little squeaks. We can't even hear you. Sorry. Yeah, and I can't read the chat while I'm sharing my screen. Yeah, so she, she had said um, you answered your question, so okay. thank you. Okay. So we can move on to the next. Perfect. Okay, authenticating agents and permissions. Um, first of all, there is some documentation right here that's actually fairly decent, I think. Um, that will tell you um, how to set up your Arctos team, which is really managing users and operators. Um, so when you have a new student or somebody who you want to give access to your collections in Arctos, maybe they're going to be doing data entry um, or some other task for you where they need access, um, these are the steps that you follow to get them set up. Um, and the first one is that they have to create an Arctos user account, and it has to follow very specific rules. So um, anybody can create a user account. Lots of people do just for downloading data. Um, but if you're going to be an operator, that is um, being able to edit things in Arctos, um, you need to have this, follow these very specific rules for your username and your password. Um, so usually if I'm um, setting somebody up for the first time, I basically copy this thing out into an email and send it to them and say, please set up a user account, follow these rules for your username and password. Once you're done, email me your new username. Uh, once I get their username, the next step is to set up an agent and put that login name um, with their agent record. After that, you can invite that person to become an operator. And they'll get an email from Arctos. They go in and authenticate. And then you can start assigning them roles and permissions. Um, but there's also this nifty little pro tip here that um, somebody at MSB told me about. And that is, instead of involving your new user in all this process of back and forth, um, you can just pretend to be them. Um, so you can create a user account with a username and password that meets those criteria. Um, 
but put your email address on the profile. Um, that way, when you send the invitation to become an operator, the email will come to you. You can authenticate. Um, and once it's all set up, then you can tell your new user, here's your username, here's your temporary password, please change it. Um, and um, they'll be ready to go. You can assign them permissions. So hopefully that answers that question. That pro tip is mind-blowing. I, right? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because um, there is this little back and forth, and usually you need to have your new operator kind of like sitting next to you on a different computer, and it's a, a little push and pull. So um, that's great to streamline the process. So anybody have questions about that? Seems like everyone is a fan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> great. Yeah. Great yeah. tip. Much easier. Love that tip. <laughs> um, okay. So next up we have using the image uploader tool. So this is the, um, if you have like 50 images or less tool that you can use in Arctos to upload a bunch at one time. Um, so again, here we have pretty good documentation for this process. Um, and it's all in one file for doing media uploads. So at the beginning of the document is uploading single files. But then this small batch upload section um, walks you through the steps for uploading approximately less than 50 photos. It kind of depends on the size of your photos. Um, they need to be JPEG. So this process will not work with raw images. Um, but if you have JPEGs um, and if you name those files appropriately, um, this process is really super easy. Um, you, you put all of your photos into a folder and zip it up. Um, you go to the uploader in Arctos and um, just upload that zip file. And then about 24 hours, sometimes it takes a little longer, it depends on what's going on at TAC you'll get an email back with a CSV file that is essentially the file you need to add all the metadata to that media in Arctos. Um, it requires a little bit of massaging, um, but it's really just adding a couple of columns or more if you want to add a bunch of um, labels and descriptions and relationships. Um, usually what I do when I name my files, I name them with the catalog number of whatever they belong with. Um, that way, when I get the file back, the JPEG file names that are in media already have the catalog number kind of built into them. And I can just edit that down to make the appropriate relationship to the cataloged item. Um, just to show you where that is in Arctos, um, it's in these batch tools. There is, oh, I probably won't be able to get down there because my screen's too big. Uh, upload media metadata is where you put the file up, and upload images is where you add the zip file. Um, and I think, let's see if I still have stuff kind of sitting around in there. I probably don't. No. Um, but it's a really easy process. Um, I was telling Emily yesterday that I had approximately 500 images um, of specimens to upload. Um, and so just every day, I would put 50 on there, um, get my file back, get the metadata added, and then the next day, I would do 50 more. And it just really took no time at all, and it was I didn't have to try to mess with CyberDuck and um, the odd way of uploading things to TAC and then figuring out where they are. It, um, it just works really great. So do you guys? Teresa, I had a question that had come to me from our uh, curator uh -huh. of fishes. And he was trying to do this process. And he said, 
I tried loading a zip file through the Arctos upload images interface, but kept getting a no space left mm. message. Can you, have you ever had that? I have not. And so that is probably, I would say put an issue for Dusty because he may, it may be that, and it probably is that, um, there's a limited amount of space for those uploads and there's not anything auto cleaning it out. Um, so that Dusty may need to go in there and clean it out so that there's space for new stuff to go in. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Teresa, uh -huh. can you hear me? Um, so where do those batch zip file uploads go is, is that exactly? Do they, does it create a, some kind of subfolder at TAC or where, where are they? Yeah, so they go, it's wherever. So when you upload single files, it's whoever's doing the upload, it's going to go in that same folder where your single uploads go. Okay, because, yeah, because at MVZ, you know, we've created all of these directories that, where we put our uh, egg images and our field notes and stuff. So would it go in a file that's like MVZ slash? I like think so, uh-huh. And then you could, you could move it around from there, but you would want to do that. Um, probably before you upload the metadata so that you get the right directory. Right. But once, yeah, but once they're up at TAC, we can't really move them, right? You can only move them if they're sitting on the, like, corral up FTP. Yeah, yeah, because right. I've never moved anything around. I, there's, I mean, I have in my user folder is a ton of UTEP stuff because I uploaded it, so it's in my Arctos user folder. Right, so if you want stuff to go to a, like an existing folder or directory, um, then you need to do the FTP. Yeah. Probably, yep. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Anybody have questions about it? Yeah, I was just going to say it might be worth um, asking Dusty or, or Chris about that because I could see, um, you know, if you're doing a large digitization project, this is a lot more user friendly for um, students to be working on um, doing the small batches versus the file transfer protocol. Um, so maybe there is a way given that um, those are stable URLs. So um, there might be a way to organize the directory like after they're assigned. Um, that would be yeah. awesome because, you know, sometimes like we have all this stuff that we already uploaded, but if we want to add to the folder, it'd be nice to do it, not have to FTP it, but I want to make sure it goes to the right place, so that's what I end up doing. Yeah. Yeah, because it is Definitely. a two-part process, right? First, you're adding, you're actually uploading those photos. Um, so in between that and before you do the metadata where you're attaching that media to things in Arctos, um, you should be able to move it around. It's just a question of how would we facilitate that. Right, yeah. I'd like to propose this as a topic of one of our short training videos. Um, maybe we can do a demo on this. Um, yeah. If, anybody else think that would be helpful? Yeah, I'd like I don't to have any happen. media. Right. I would. Yeah, really if somebody has some media um, that they would like uploaded that they can send to me. I could do it. I don't have anything right now that needs to be done otherwise because it, would, it wouldn't take me long to do this at all and I'd be happy to make the little video of that. I can absolutely <laughs> send you lots of <laughs> photographs that haven't been uploaded to our records. We've got five or six thousand photographs that we're still trying to get um, put into our, you know, our, our um, catalog records. So I'd be yeah, happy like to just send, send me five or ten, so it's kind of manageable from the standpoint of a video, and um, and I'll do that for you, no problem. And then hopefully you could follow that same process and just do it yourself. Uh huh. Thank you. And I'm creating the um, issue right now on the no space left issue. Um, and uh, I'm awesome. tagging you Thank in there, you. Teresa. Okay. So next up, we have tagging media. Um, so the first part of this question is, how do you tag media um, 
in a PDF format, and you can't. Um, tagging is only available on JPEGs. So, um, which I found this out, I don't know, probably a couple of years ago when I was trying to um, tag some field notes that were in Arctos as PDF. Um, so what I did is I took, yeah? Teresa, you can, I think, um, do tag raw files. At least we have media that store uh, yeah, yeah. TIFF so files that, have to be image that we can files. tag. So they, I don't they have to be image files, not text files, yeah. which a PDF is kind of a text file. Um, so anyways, I took these PDFs um, and just converted them to JPEGs. And if you have um, Adobe Acrobat Pro, that's pretty easy to do. You just say, take this PDF and make it into a bunch of JPEGs, and it does it for you. Um, and then I loaded those JPEGs as multi-page documents, so um, which probably um, we don't want to go through that whole thing right now. But um, I'll show you one of the multi-page documents right here. So this is Art Harris's uh, field catalog. Um, and you can see the way a multi-page document works is each one of the JPEGs has the same document title and so then uh, and a page number. So you actually have to number these things yourself. Um, but once you have that set up, um, you can move between the pages with the previous and next here. Um, and for any given page that you're on, you can see things that are tagged. Um, and then you can see the document itself here. And the things that are tagged are also um, blocked out here, which I think if I um, do the scroll to tag, see it'll make, it'll show you which box belongs with this tag. Um, also, um, with, for this, there's some fairly decent documentation. It's less of a how-to. Um, than just sort of here's how they work. Um, this little paragraph right here. Um, so this is one where probably having a how-to would work. And I don't know, maybe this webinar itself can be the how-to, because I was going to tag um, one of our specimens to this page. Um, you can see on this page, there's only two things tagged, but there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so I went and found one of these that um, I could tag to this, um, which I have bookmarked right here. Um, and the way I found it was by searching for that um, field number, which you can see right here, the collector number, AAH4155. And um, right here we've got 4155, and this is Art Harris. Um, and you can double check by what species are we talking about here, what species are we talking about here. Um, this particular thing has had a name change over time, so, but it is the same thing. So um, we can create a new tag right from the media. Um, and you can pick what you want to connect the tag to from here. We're going to connect it to a cataloged item. Um, this one's going to be UTEP PERP. Sorry, I have access to a whole bunch of collections, so it's a little crazy. Um, we're going to use the catalog number, which is 1516. Oops, lost my tag, sorry. And then um, I don't think we need to fill this part out. Let's see if it works. Yeah. So now you can see it's got the, the tag here. It tells you what it's referencing. You could enter a remark here if you wanted to. And then you can move the tag around to get it to the right place on the page. See if I can get it to go up there.
Um, and once you have the box in the right place and you've got your tag all filled out, you just hit Create Tag. And now we've got that. And then if you go back to this record right here, which you can see has no media on it, but now if we refresh it, it should have the media. So see, it says tagged in media. So that's how the tagging works. Um, and again, it has to be on an image file. So um, a JPEG, a RAW file, a TIFF file will work. Any questions? like we've got one coming. That was very cool. I've never actually done that. <laughs> um, oh, nope. People just say, super cool. Nope, thanks. Magical. Yeah, it's really, the, the great part is, um, and so I think Art really loved this, is that now his catalog is all in here and related to those specimens. Obviously, it's not completely done because there's a lot left to be tagged. Um, but he can flip through the catalog and find things um, and then just go straight to the specimen, even though the catalog number is different than his collector number. So it's a really cool thing. Yeah, very useful. All right. So the next thing is, Trace, I have a Comment about that before we go on. I'm just checking right now really quickly, Mario. Um, at one point I had an issue in here about searching, using the search page, search specimen page to find tagged items. Oh, yeah. And I'm wondering, I can't remember if that actually was ever done. I don't think it was because so, I had to, I basically just had to flip through his field catalog to look for stuff that wasn't tagged. Um, because if I did a specimen search for all of art stuff, I could see media, but I couldn't tell if it was a tag or if it was actual media. So, so yeah, I don't think that option exists where you can say, just show me stuff tagged in media. I think that would be really useful yeah. um, so that we could find everything that is tagged and, um, and uh, you know, know which ones we have to add. So I'll go to see if I can track that issue down and revive it. Sweet. Okay. So um, next, next we had a question from Phyllis, who's um, not able to attend, but um, she wanted to know if the record count that's just on the main um, specimen search page, when you log in, it says how many um, catalog items are in your collection, if that included encumbered records. And I checked with Dusty, and he said that um, it includes all encumbrances except for the mask record, which entirely masks a record. So any other types of encumbrances, like mask collector, or coordinates, or year, NAGPRA category, those would be included in the count, but um, not the fully masked um, or encumbered records. So um, I will check with Phil to see if, if she needed that um, functionality. But um, that's good to know. I, did, I didn't realize that. Um, and that could really affect your total count if you have, um, like for instance, our our curator. We we encumber all of our records until she publishes. So that might be you know batches of two thousand specimens per field season. So um, yeah, that's good to point out. So which count are you? Where are you referring to the count? So um, Teresa, if you don't mind just going to the specimen search page. Um, so when you first log on, um, it'll adjust the overall Arctos, you know, spec uh, record count to um, however many records are in your particular collection. So that or eight hundred thousand number, yeah. or also just or on on the portal. portal page. You're talking about page. Yeah. If you're, if you're logged in, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and so you know, for count don't always match either and it has to do I think with I don't know I, we've had this issue discussion with Dusty about you know because um, I think it has to do with whether what permission what, what collections you have permission to and 
you know, it, yeah, those two counts don't always match, and I still don't quite understand why. Hmm. Yeah, and there's probably more that could be done for um, lot-based collections because obviously the count is is just going to be the records versus um, you know the total uh, specimen counts um, for a lot-based collection or um, catalog item counts. So um, yeah, there might be something we want to add to um, maybe report services where you can do really uh, accurate tallies um, because sometimes I like to say we have you know a hundred thousand um, cataloged items, but it's more like, you know, 130,000 specimens in our collection. Yeah, another thing that I was actually trying to do this yesterday is to try to get, like, if there was an easy way of getting count by, other than doing, like, an SQL query for specific, like, parts, like, I was trying to figure out of, of our egg and nest collection, how many eggs we have, how many mm -hmm. nests, how many eggs plus nests. It's not really easy to get those number right yeah yeah exactly um yeah we can make a github i will do that i'll make a github issue i, I agree with that yeah the trying to figure out the parts without having to go through sql i mean just for like grants or you know or reports or whatever yeah and angie mentions this is part of the question that derek brought up about um records versus items so um, maybe I'll find that thread and um, bring that issue forward again. Cool. What do we have next on the Google Doc? OK. Uh, it would be nice if questions regarding a specific feature in Arctos were accessible within that features, so others would be able to find the answers when trying to execute a particular feature. So I think, um, I, would, I would kind of like to see an example of this, but I think it, it would be sort of like, for instance, with this, um, with the um, file, the JPEG file uploader, um, if there were links to maybe directly to the handbook about that instead of having to go to the about help, then go to the handbook and find um, find the thing that you're looking for. And I think we can do that. It's a question of somebody making all the edits to these pages. Yeah, there might be a way. Um, <laughs> that happens in uh, when you're cataloging, I think. there's uh, When you're doing the new data entry, some of those buttons that you click on, that'll actually take you to the code table, but then there's a link that takes you over to the handbook to explain what that thing yeah. is. So however that process yeah, is it's not, um, in some of these other pages, I think that would be Yeah, helpful. it's not difficult to do. It's just a question of somebody actually doing it because it means you have to go into the code for this particular page, find where to put, you know, where would be the good place for this and put it in there. Um, I think, I mean, this is definitely something as we move forward with Postgres and potential, you know, um, somebody building their own UI, which is kind of happening, maybe, um, that we could um, sort of systematically work through these pages and add those links because you're right, in some places they're there and it's great, and in some places like here they're not. Um, so it, it's more difficult to find the help or it requires more clicking around to find it. Yeah, I agree that um, it would be good to have all those little documentation links, but even another layer above that, which maybe this is what the um, person was asking is linking to the GitHub um, issues associated um, possibly with with that page, which might be harder, but it, we might be able to do something with labels yeah. um, in GitHub and somehow mm -hmm. pull those in, um, possibly. Yeah, probably that's not. Better. Yeah, probably with labels, because I think you could set up a search that's like everything with this label and then put a link to it. So again, that's just if somebody doing that that takes the, the time, um, but it's a really good idea, so. 
And I would suggest yeah. everybody who's on here, um, if you are working in Arctos and you come across something like that where you're like, oh, there's this great how-to that goes with this, but it took me 15 minutes to go find it. It would be nice if the link was here. If you'll just put it on GitHub, um, then somebody will see it and probably take care of it. Um, I think if we just assume that a bunch of us as volunteers are going to systematically start going through there and adding these links, it's probably not going to happen. So, Yeah, and Mary Beth um, commented that this was her question. Of course, not everything is documented in the how-to documentation. If I do something and create an error message, I don't always know what I've done or why. If there was a record of other people's problems with certain features, that yeah, would be helpful. No, I, yeah, mm -hmm. agreed. And, and we, we should probably also just consider making a um, how-to on, like, what, do, what are these error messages? Oh, and like there what, what is one mean? already, um, oh. but it's not very good. So, um, yeah, and I think because the error messages in Oracle are very cryptic, um, it, it sometimes mm -hmm. makes it hard. I'm hoping that when we move to Postgres, it won't be as bad. Um, but yeah, and I mean, again, I always feel free to just put an issue on GitHub. I got this error message. What does it mean? Um, because I think those usually get yeah. a response pretty quick. Somebody knows or Dusty will respond to those. Yep. OK, um, next up. If I add several other specimen parts that require a location, like a, so the, the location attribute for the part, um, but they're all in the same location, can I enter it just once, or must I enter it with each additional part? Um, so that location attribute is specific to the part it's attached to. Um, so in a way, my answer to this is it's up to you. Um, if you know that all those parts are in that one location and you don't want to spend a bunch of time adding that attribute to each individual part, there's nothing that says you have to. Um, but it's set up that way because you could have four parts in four different locations. Um, and so they might it might have four different locations. Um, that's maybe not the best answer, but um, that's the one I've got. It would be a good place for you to use the, the remarks field if you're going to just use the one um, location uh, part attribute and just in that remarks field say all parts at this location and then it's really clear uh, if you pull up, um, you know, and you're, you're scrolling through that, that whole group of parts. Excellent. That's an excellent idea. So and I didn't pull up an example of something that has that attribute, but um, does anybody else have questions about that? We're good? Nope, okay. We're all set. Uh, next up, when I see the verbose Arctos emails that populate my inbox, I wonder if it's writing a huge glossary of textbook textbook terminology. Maybe there should be another accessible resource to store all this knowledge where one can look up a term. Well, so there's the all of the Arctos help and handbook is one place to start always. Um, so the Learn Arctos, Arctos handbook. Um, you've got documentation, how to's and uh, resources. Resources is just summaries of the how to's. So they're kind of grouped together by topic um, that hopefully makes them a little more helpful than just in the big, long alphabetical list of the how-tos. Um, but the other thing is the code tables. Um, so in Arctos, you don't even have to be logged in. You can do search code tables. And you get a list of all the tables in Arctos. Um, these are a little bit cryptic. Um, I will admit, and it would be nice if they were um, easier to figure out. But I think for the most part, you can figure out what you're looking for. Um, so the one that I am almost always using is the part name table. 
which is called specimen part name right here. Um, and each of these tables are lists of the terms that you can use in that field, so the values that are allowed in that field. Um, and if they're done properly, they should have nice definitions. But of course, we have a lot of legacy terms that have no definitions. Um, and this is part of the reason we're having a workshop at Spinach to work on code table definitions. Um, so if anybody's coming to Spinach, I hope that you will sign up and come to our workshop and help us um, flesh out some of these. So here in the part table, you can see um, there's the part name, the collections that are able to use it, whether it's a tissue or not, and then a definition for that part name. Um, if you scroll through this table, you will find um, maybe not a lot of things that don't have a definition, because I actually had a student add a bunch for me recently. Um, but you will find things that have either no definition or, or poor definition. One of the things I've been trying to do with these especially is to include links to the Wikipedia page about the name so that there's even a more a larger definition, sometimes with photos and whatever else. Um, but like you can see here, there's a whole bunch of terms with no definition at all. So um, that can be challenging. But that's the best place to go find um, the terminology. Um, back to the getting all these Arctos emails, um, I would like to point out that um, if all these emails are coming to you from GitHub, um, one thing you can do is manage your GitHub notifications. And um, we have some pretty good documentation for how to do that in the how-tos um, so that you can cut down on the emails you get from GitHub. The only um, challenge to this is that if you start cutting down your emails, um, you do need to go check GitHub on your own. Um, otherwise, you'll be out of the loop of the conversation. Um, if you want to be in the loop, you probably should go check every now and then to see if you're missing out on things. Um, but you can stop the emails altogether, or you can only get emails if you're mentioned or participating in a conversation, um, which will help um, keep your inbox less gunked up with GitHub. So did I answer that question? Yeah, I think so. Um, so probably have time for one. Uh, let's, let's do those other questions, and then we'll probably want to get to some announcements. Um, so these are new from Beth. Let's see. How do accessions appear on project pages? Do they only appear after you've cataloged the specimens associated with that accession? Um, I have not done a lot of projects, but I do know that is how you associate cataloged records with projects is through accessions. Um, so if you want to go to, do you have any projects? I think you can add an accession to a, a project, and it will show up, um, but you won't be able to necessarily, yeah, the question is, will you see, the yeah, specimen, will you see it associated if, it's not, if they're not cataloged? No, so I mean, like as you said, um, you can attach an accession to a project at the time that you create the project or the accession. But in terms of the statistics of, you know, number of uh, projects that contributed to this project and number of specimens used and all of those kinds of things that you see on the project page, they need to be at the catalog so, level. So they have to be cataloged first. It won't show. It's not going to show unless you're logged in and. What, and do you go to if you go to, if you're logged in and you go to edit project, you'll see a list of all of the accessions that are attached to that project. But if you're on the like the public projects page, it's not going to show that. It'll just show the specimen data. So um, if you attach a um, an accession to a project, it will show. It should show up on the project. It just won't have any specimens associated with it if there are no specimens in that accession. But right, but yeah. it won't show on the public projects. Page. No, it won't show the no. accession number or anything like that. Right? 
It only shows that right. if you go to edit project or the operator. This is a problem I just ran into yesterday, too, from the public page, because we had um, there had been a number of accessions that didn't, they had not associated those accessions with the project. And then, again, from the public page, you, we saw half the number of specimens related to that project because of the failure to link the accession. So you need to make sure that when you have accessions, especially if you have students doing it, that the, the entry that you link the project page at some point. Teresa, do you want to show how to link a, an accession uh, to a project real quick? Just for anybody who's interested. I'll just say it's the same issue with loans. You know, any transaction that you know, loans or accessions. Yeah, for anything to show up on a project page, accessions are recording the these are the specimens contributed by a project, and then the specimens used are have to be associated with loans. So loans have to link to the project to get you the specimens used, and accessions have to be associated with a project to get specimens contributed. Right. So this particular project, um, it it's a project that only used specimens. Um, so there is a loan that's associated with it, and that's what, and those 51 herp specimens are in that loan. Um, if instead those had been contributed to the project um, through an accession, so somebody had gone out and done some collecting, um, you just edit the project, and right here you add an accession, um, and then it, you're it looks like you're at the search accessions page, which you kind of are, um, and then you start searching for it. I'm sorry, guys. Um, and once you've located your accession, um, you just pick it. And then when you go back to the project, it'll be added. And what would happen then is when you look at the project page, um, you would see um, specimens contributed and then specimens used. But again, if there's no um, cataloged items in the accession or in the loan, then you won't see anything here. So this is a really, this is Angie, this is a really good, another place where we need to strike specimen and change to uh -huh. catalog records because um, this, as you mentioned, this is a publicly accessible page that you don't have to be an operator to access, correct? Yeah. This is what the public Yeah, essentially. Sees. They would see this without the edit project thing in the corner. Yep. And so we very specifically manage our transactions regarding NAGPRA mm -hmm. through projects. And so if we show 51 under specimens used, we have uh, connections to these projects uh, for repatriations of human remains. This would be incredibly offensive for a, a community or a lineal descendant to come through and see um, that linkage on there. So um, I'm going to. If everybody's okay with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask Dusty. Um, I assume this is part of uh, what can easily be. Changed. Yeah, I would think this would be pretty easy for him to to change. So I would go ahead and ask for that. Yeah, okay. I agree. But would you want it to say catalog records or catalog items? Because a lot of times they're more than just the record, right? Because they're borrowing the specimen or whatever. So what would work, Angie? Um, the well, it's whatever we do standard um, for the 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 other page. So whatever we've got on the, I think records is fine because you might have several individuals that are. are so if, if we're talking about repatriation of human remains, you might have one record that has a cranium, and it might have a you know, some other skeletal material, but it's usually described in one record. Um, and then if there's unassociated or associated funerary objects that are with that, um, those would all be linked within probably multiple records, but they're within. Those, we, we do those as a transaction, I think, 
um, as a loan, essentially, to, to document uh, that repatriation has happened. So the, the, um, those individual records that reference those, um, those items that have been repatriated would be linked through the loan. So I think it's okay to have records rather than items there. Because that would be more analogous to the, the way that it's listed right now, right? I mean, it's... Yeah, okay. I know we're running out of time, but Carla, I just put a thing in the chat um, about publications linking to projects. And I think we had this, this discussion before. If a project is linked to specimens or has, or, excuse me, cataloged items that are um, linked to publications, do the publications automatically get associated with the project, or does it have to be done manually? Let's say that again. If a project contains a specimen linked to a publication, does the pub auto link? You have to. Oh, if the specimen. Uh, I think yeah. you have to do it manually, actually. Because that seems like a big yeah. gap in to, our ability to track yeah. publications. Since you can, you know, you, yeah, adding specimen citations to a publication is a separate process from adding the publication to the project. So, um, and even if the specimen is linked to a project through an transaction, I still think you have to manually add that publication. I know we discussed doing it, having some automated process before, but this would be hugely mm -hmm. helpful if we could do that. All right. Um, so let's move on to the last question. Um, so we can be mindful of the time, but Beth also asks, um, how do you handle the MOUs for federal repositories and Arctos for permits if they don't have an assigned number. Um, and my answer to that would be the for under accessions, you don't actually have to use um, numeric ca um, characters only. So um, for like a lot of our legacy material that really um, doesn't have an accession, a lot of people might use accession 0 or 999. But you could also, like in our collection, we've actually said legacy 1 because we actually know who donated um, the material, but it, it doesn't fit into like a numbering system, so you can actually use alpha characters. So you might just write MOU, US Fish and Wildlife 2020, or however you want to um, arrange your your MOUs. Um, I think that would be suitable. Does that answer your question? Oh, Emily, so. So you're not putting them in as a, I think Beth was asking, can you add an MOU as a permit, right? If it doesn't oh, I have see. A permit I'm sorry. Number. Right, because it's essentially giving you a permit authorization. It's equivalent to a permit. Um, but a permit requires a number. Oh, does it? It's restricted to numeric text only? No, it's not restricted to numeric. I don't think that the permit... It requires when you add a permit, you know. Um, sorry, when you add a permit, you don't actually have to have a number because we we have a, a generic deed of gift permit that I use because uh, just to show that we have the legal document showing why we have an accession, um, and I just have one in there, and there's no number. It's just blanket deed of gift and blanket uh, bill of sale for things that we've purchased. And I just assign, it's just a blanket one for our collection. So you don't actually need a number in there. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, it looks like when you're creating a permit that it's a required field to put something in there, which it may or may not be, I don't know. But you can put anything in there. I mean, it doesn't have to be numeric. It can be alphanumeric. So you could put, like, NPS, MOU, and the date, or, you know, whatever you want in there, something that identifies it as unique. That's what I would do. Yeah, that answers your question. Um, great. Well, um, I'm going to share my screen. Angie, you touched on that um, change, uh, basically, from, from specimen to catalog record. Do you want to share anything else about that um, before I kind of get into the tutorial blitz? Yeah, I don't think 
Um, there's anything really too big to change or to mention. I think most people who have uh, been at the working group meetings know that um, we, for a long time on the cultural side, have been concerned about the use of the term specimen. And so we've been embarking upon the process of changing references to specimen uh, over to catalog record. And the prioritization has been at those public portals, uh, the pages that the, the public can access. And so the main thing has been on the main search screen. Instead of saying access to blah, 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 records, it shows or uh, specimens, it shows records now. See the results as catalog records rather than specimens. Um, and when you get your search results, it shows it as number of records rather than um, specimens. So this is, um, we've got a, a little blog post that's coming out in the newsletter that kind of uh, describes from the cultural standpoint, why this is important, and as I just mentioned, um, with human remains and, and um, repatriation of ancestors, this is something that's a very important uh, topic for us to move forward to be more sensitive to uh, indigenous people and the different kinds of collections that are in Arctis. It also makes these counts more representative uh, to what we're actually talking about, rather than you know assuming that if there's 200,000 entries in Arctos that that actually means that you have 200,000 items. And so we're still, as we've been talking here, um, we're still trying to figure out how to best manage those real accurate tallies of physical things in the collections. And so this is um, part of a process that we're moving through. And, and so you will still continue to see the term specimen sprinkled around in Arctos. Um, but I think that that has to do more with the more deeply embedded code um, and URLs, static uh, URLs and things like that that are part of um, the navigational process of Arctos, which is beyond my pay grade, and something that Dusty's working on. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at, kind of a, just a little progress report. Great. Thank you. Um, and la last but not least, before we go, um, also that will happen, um, or that you'll see in the newsletter, um, is our Arctos tutorial blitz. Um, so um, you'll get in the newsletter sort of a link to this document and all the important links. But essentially, with the blitz, we're hoping to generate a bunch of um, short video tutorial content on the majority of actions that one can perform in Arctos. So these would be supplemental to the written documentation and essentially provide users an option to watch a video, um, a little video clip. Um, rather than reading through or in addition to reading through the documentation. Um, but they're going to be really short, so one to four minutes, um, where at your own convenience you can just record yourself providing step-by-step -step instructions on how to fill in fields and push buttons and navigate to different screens um, in order to perform a specific Arctos task. Um, and they're really, they can be really small actions. So it could be something like how to edit an attribute, um, or it could be a really complex task, like how to move different um, catalog records out of a specimen event and, and into another one. Um, so it's kind of whatever you feel comfortable um, instructing someone on how to do. Um, but there is a um, sign-up sheet, which leads you to this Google Doc, um, to this page. Um, so I've kind of pre-generated some topics, but absolutely feel free to add your own um, and even break things up into smaller tasks. So for instance, um, you know, if you're going to do one on how to create a loan, you could even do a separate one on how to add items to that loan or how to print an invoice from the loan page. So um, we don't want, you know, 10-minute long spiels. We want people to be able to really quickly get to um, the, the action that they're wanting help with. Um, and anyone can do these, so I know it's kind of like can make you nervous to do one, but um, if you've done an action once in Arctos, like you're, ab you're better able to instruct someone who's never done it before. Um, so please sign up for one of these. Um, I have links to um, how to record using PowerPoint, um, and it's really easy. Um, there's a little tutorial I did that's like a minute or two. And it really just involves clicking one or two buttons um, to share your screen and record your voice in PowerPoint. There's also one on how to record in Zoom. Again, there's a link to the tutorial. And these um, tutorials are also on our Arctos YouTube channel if you want to find them there. Um, 
And basically the tutorial content is really up to you um, as to the exact shape of it and sort of the examples you'll use, but we do have some general um, guidelines, which is also in this little announcement, um, just to keep things consistent. So, um, you know, stating the title of the tutorial, kind of orienting people to, you know, what page in the database you're on or how to navigate to a certain screen. Um, if your tutorial is, um, you know, on encumbrances or relationships, you, you'll want to define those terms um, versus something like how to create a loan. People know what that is. Um, so essentially, you'll, re you'll record your tutorial. Um, you'll save your MP4 and um, rename the MP4 with the title of your tutorial, and then you'll just drop it um, in this folder. And at that point, I will be able to grab that and pull that into YouTube, into the Arctos documentation. So um, we're really challenging everyone to hopefully at least make one tutorial over um, the course of the month. So their deadline is um, Valentine's Day to show your Arctos love. Um, but definitely feel free to ask your volunteers or your students or your other staff, um, anyone who's familiar with Arctos, to try and make a tutorial. And that will really help us out um, and, and get our sort of video documentation filled out. So um, I will definitely bug you about this over and over um, for the next 30 days without being too annoying, um, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, yeah, try to get excited, and we hope to see you um, sign up. So any last comments or questions from anyone before we leave?